Let's add a little bit more details to the uh, heat transports, cross-equatorial heat transports. We talked about MJOs and MESOs, and we know that they have Kelvin waves and they have these uh, intra-seasonal winds that are m propagating across. You would expect that there is a uh, associated cross-equatorial heat transport as well. And this, again, is from using a, a mo the same model of McCreary et al., uh, forced with... Uh, uh, NCEP, uh, net surface fluxes and average winds, uh, you see the climatology of the zonal averaged uh, ocean heat flux. Uh, we have uh, northward and southward transports as we expect during the monsoon season and non-monsoon seasons, summer and winter monsoon if you will. And you look at the two years, 87 were, were strong and sorry, weak and strong monsoons. This was the uh, second half of the 86-87 El Nino, and this was cool, colder and was a La Nina. And you can see that there are clearly winter and summer monsoon uh, intra-seasonal signals in the cross-equatorial transports as well, right? In the climatologies, you're smoothing them out, but there are clearly these intra-seasonal timescales here. Uh, it turns out that they are in the net not very large. Uh, the uh, seasonality of the heat transport itself is much stronger than, than these uh, intra-seasonal components. So leaving that uh, idea behind, uh, maybe there is a way to pull this all together. This is what the book calls a holistic view of the monsoon system. So you have to convince yourself that this works for you because uh, this is a hypothesis that is proposed by the work based on the author. So it's looking at anomalous meridional heat transport here for uh, starting with one year uh, pre-monsoon season and going into the uh, winter of the following year. And this is the anomalous circulation associated with those looking for this biennial variability. Uh, to complete the holistic monsoon story. And the idea added here as compared to before is this a strong dependence on the impact of these uh, uh, circulation changes on the east-west uh, SST gradient as well and uh, try to relate them to wind changes. In the uh, Pacific Ocean, the zonal extent is very large, SST gradient is very large, and the pressure gradient associated with the SST gradient is fairly significant. So on El Nino-La Nina timescales, there is a strong relation between the east-west SST gradient anomalies and zonal wind anomalies. Does the same thing work in the Indian Ocean? Not very clear, but nonetheless, it's invoked here to bring in the uh, potentially uh, a role played by the Indian Ocean dipole as well uh, on this uh, monsoon theory here, uh, the holistic view of the monsoon here. So the Indian Ocean cross section is shown here. Uh, starting here, let's say you start somehow with the cold uh, northern hemisphere and warm southern hemisphere uh, anomaly. Uh, that's going to give you a uh, reduced monsoon circulation because uh, uh, let's say this has come out of a previous year's strong monsoon. Uh, then you have a uh, reduced uh, uh, southward Ekman transport, so that's going to leave, so weak northern hemisphere monsoon is going to result from this. So that weak monsoon circulation is going to give you uh, a reduced upwelling uh, on the west, so give you a warming here, and increased upwelling in the east, so it's going to give you a zonal temperature gradient as well as uh, uh, associated uh, zonal wind signature. Uh, in terms of a delta U that is negative, so there is an easterly anomaly as uh, you can see here. Again, very hand-wavy argument, so you have to be careful. 
then in SON you end up with a weak monsoon producing a warm northern hemisphere and colder uh, southern hemisphere because there is the loss of uh, Ekman transport. Uh, that's going to produce a weak uh, southern hemisphere monsoon over Australia um, and that's going to leave the northern hemisphere still warm and then the uh, that is going to drive a strong northern hemisphere monsoon in the following year so we haven't exactly explained how this persistence happens from JJA to GJF DJF but we have used persistence diagrams before to argue that uh, at least in DJF to JJF there is a strong persistence in the Indian Ocean. The other thing to notice here is that we have kind of switched between heat content and SST uh, kind of without distinguishing them very much. Uh, also we haven't said heat content down to what? What depth of heat content? And there isn't always a very clear relation between the heat content and the anomaly. People always look for SST uh, and the monsoon anomaly. People always look for relation between the monsoon and the SSTs, but monsoon and the heat content is a different story. So it's not clear always that a increased heat storage is corresponding to a increased SST because there is the thermocline in the middle and all these processes that we talked about about mixed layer heat budgets. So one has to be careful about all those sorts of details. Nonetheless, we are here in JJA2 following year with the strong northern hemisphere monsoon which is giving us not only the uh, strong uh, Ekman transport and cooling going into fall months but also intensified monsoon circulation is going to increase upwelling on the west and reduce the upwelling in the east and give us a delta U that is now westerly which is going to reinforce the warming here and then uh, give you uh, growth of the negative dipole and these are the implied associated changes in the uh, thermocline uh, as well. So somehow it is implied that these sea surface temperature anomalies and wind forcing anomalies are associated with the thermocline movement as well. So one can look at the relation between um, thermocline depth and SST anomalies are an indicator of their interactions and such a figure is provided in a paper by Anamalai and others which included me as well and you see that in the eastern region uh, there is a Birkness, there is a react interaction between uh, thermocline anomalies and SST anomalies and there is also a strong interaction in the southwestern dome that we talked about where the thermocline shows uh, that such a reaction uh, happens. So this is the uh, idea of how the coupled monsoon system uh, works and also gives us the uh, quasi-biennial or biennial time scales. The idea of uh, uh, the interactions between the Indian and Pacific Oceans is presented simply as strong trades uh, giving us strong South Asian monsoon which we have already seen and weak trades giving us weak South Asian monsoon. Remembering that only 50% of the strong and weak monsoons are explained by El Nino. Okay? Nonetheless, one can look at the growth and decay of uh, the monsoon and walker circulation convection. So looking at the symmetric uh, OLR and asymmetric OLR uh, along the equator and 14 north. So here you are uh, the evolution oops, going from January through December and the idea is that when the uh, walker cell is uh, weak, then the uh, OLR, symmetric OLR or the Indian region tends to be strong in the pre-monsoon season and vice versa. When this is strong, uh, this is weaker. So again, that is somehow supposed to lead to the uh, quasi-biennial time scale. So if you want to read it, schematics representing the interaction of the anomalous monsoon with the coupled ocean atmosphere system of the Pacific Ocean. Many ideas are proposed here that the uh, Eastern Indian Ocean uh, SST anomaly and the convection anomaly generates a Kelvin wave which goes through the Philippine anticyclone into the uh, Pacific Ocean and has strong interactions. There are also direct walker cell perturbations but there are many papers uh, now uh, 
showing that there is in fact a strong impact of the Indian Ocean uh, with the uh, Pacific coupled system. So this is a schematic of the gross surface wind variability we, which we have talked about. Uh, in B we are showing growth and decay of convection associated with the monsoon and the walker cell plotted as a function of longitude. Consistent with the regression analysis we had seen before, growth of the monsoon convection precedes the development of equatorial convection. Uh, and C, relative timing of the influence of the anomalous monsoon on the coupled Pacific Ocean system. So anom anomalous Pacific trade winds occur at the time of minimum longitudinal SST gradient along the equator. So each spring the um, gradient flattens uh, seasonally but anomalously speaking uh, strong uh, weakening of the SST gradient comes with the uh, Pacific trade winds. Uh, so this is the interannual time scale. So can the two of them interact together to produce the biennial time scale? That's kind of the heuristic argument made here based on this data. So you can also look uh, as a final figure possible influences of monsoon anomalies on ENSO. So you have uh, external influences here which include influence of monsoon bienniality on ENSO. So evolving mo uh, strong monsoon uh, can uh, drive strong PO trades and uh, perturb the system during the uh, period of spring bar predictability barrier or what we called the, the time period of low signal to noise ratio as spring frailty. So climate variability in the Pacific can get kicked by the monsoon during that time. So you can see here the um, uh, blue curve uh, corresponding to the uh, let's see let's oops sorry um, strong and weak monsoons so the ocean atmosphere detachment system susceptible to forcing in the spring months why am I doing that and then El Nino tendency is shown here and La Nina tendency is shown here so both of them are susceptible to evolving uh, weak or strong monsoons and can be amplified and there are some papers even claiming that the predictability of ENSO is enhanced by the Indian Ocean influence. Okay, So make sure you understood the figure. Uh, there is the La Nina evolution and there is the El Nino evolution. So that's the spring frailty that we are uh, talking about. So whew, if you are convinced that's good. This I will leave as a last figure from one of my own book chapters prepared by Jishin Zhu from uh, NOAA and I would just argue that keep your eye on the ITCZ. So if you look at the ITCZ as this uh, contour of rainfall with sea surface temperatures and winds shown as well, uh, there is MAM beginning of the, the pre-monsoon season with warm SSTs over there. During SON you have the cooling and the uh, ITCZ kind of uh, occupying this whole uh, Indo-Pacific warm pool and the monsoon region, uh, uh, sorry this is JJA, o uh, occupying the whole region. By SON you are beginning to retreat and by DJF you have retreated uh, further south as a whole. So. We have talked about the splitting of the ITCZ and the tropical convergence zone uh, and so on, but uh, are these just one part of the big ITCZ conglomeration or are the, is the monsoon system really completely independent of the ITCZ? Especially considering the animation we saw where the rainfall and the SST uh, activity is very high in the East Indian Ocean uh, during the monsoon season including the mesos and so on. So all these are kind of open questions. What is the relation of the monsoon with the ITCZ itself? What is the relation of the monsoon with the El Nino and La Nina? Uh, and what is the relation between the trade winds and the monsoons and the interactions between the Indian Ocean and the Indo-Pacific variability especially when we talked about the Indo-Pacific tripole for example. So all those ideas are uh, generally uh, 
indicative of how complex the system is because there are multiple heat sources involved and as we know heat sources create lots of perturbations that propagate away and interact with each other so many unresolved issues that you can work on so don't think of it as not knowing anything think of it as knowing a lot which can lead you to build new hypotheses test new hypotheses look for new data and do new modeling studies and so on okay that ends this chapter so we'll conclude the course with the next uh, chapter on how tropics are changing